All right, so I've got Darren Prince on the show today. Darren is the longtime agent of Magic Johnson, Charlie Sheen, Hulk Hogan, Chevy Chase, like a lot of different people in various industries. How do you even get all these clients? Like, you know, most agents start in one thing. They represent basketball players. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at, I guess, uh, Rich Paul. He's got LeBron and all these guys. And you look at Scott Boris in baseball. The guy has that on lockdown. I've, I don't know that I've seen anybody have such a wide array of clients. Well, I started in the collectibles industry at 14. I had a baseball card business. I eventually sold that at 19, started booking autograph signings for a wider range of athletes, entertainers, and celebrities. And uh, I started the marketing agency. We're not contract agents. We specialize more in endorsements, licensing, uh, keynotes, uh, appearances, intellectual property. So because of that, we're we're able to just have all sorts of celebrities from all walks of life. So do you think that like you are more so focused on marketing and you just happen to meet all these different people because of that? Exactly. Okay. Uh, when Magic became my first client in 1993, he told me to utilize him to knock down every door because he knew he was going to become a success. It was about paying it forward and making others successful around him. And that's how life is... Uh, you know, that, that's what you want to do. That's your ultimate goal in life. And right. so I just utilized his name to build everybody else around it. Yeah, I want to I want to jump into magic later, because, I mean, if you got him in 93, that was like right after he retired, I think. Right. A couple years after. Yep. And then obviously magic has had such a crazy business career since then. So I do want to talk about that later. But for now, like, tell me, who are who are some of your other clients that you have right now? Ric Flair, um, Jerry West. Uh, Oscar De La Hoya, um, Carmen Electra, Denise Richards, Dominique Wilkins. Yeah. Um, last weekend, we just started uh, working with David Goggins. I told you we had, yeah. had a keynote in uh, Atlanta for my boy Marcus Barney for um, the uh, Circle of CEO conference. So we're always kind of picking up randoms here and there, but we're not actively searching for it. Fortunately, we don't need to. Yeah, you're not searching for all these new clients exactly. and everything else. I'm just curious now. It seems like are any of the I guess athletes active anymore in in that they're in not sports? Be, none of them are. But you know, I tell people all the time. I was with them when they were doing yeah. their careers. You know, Rodman was you know for, for for many years. I started working with him when uh, his first year with the Chicago Bulls. Did you arrange all these trips to North Korea with him? The North Korea trips, I did. You did. I was yeah. joking. You really yeah. did. I, I was the man behind the scenes. But the one front and center was my boy, Chris Volo, and Professor Joseph Turlinger, uh, who's a expert in, um, I guess, North Korean culture. Wow. So what I did behind the scenes was I had a deal with Vice initially. I dealt with uh, Shane Smith's office on that. And I forget the other producer. And there was a lot of different cancellations on that very first trip. And I realized after the fact it was actually kind of comical. I said to Steve Simon in my office, who runs my agency, that um, I'm so excited. I finally got the North Korea thing done, <laughs> and Dennis wants to meet Sai. And Sai was the South Korean <laughs> style guy. I truly did not know there was a difference. And Steve <laughs> looks at me and says, are you an idiot? How are you sending him? to North Korea. And I go, what are you talking about? And he starts pulling stuff up on the internet. Well, uh, to be honest with you, he didn't know either at the time. But, you know, to Dennis's credit, Dennis was didn't like, know. he goes, just keep me safe, dude, because something huge can come out of this. I mean, maybe I can open up dialogue with the president. Why did Dennis want to even go there? Like, how did that even begin? I think they wanted Michael. Michael said now, Scotty Pippen, you know, declined. And uh, it was just... Oh, so they reached out to Dennis and Dennis they, was like, they, all right, they, let's yeah, do they, it. Re they reached out to my office and... Uh, that initial um, opportunity was a documentary that Vice was filming with the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm. And then after Dennis went that first time, I kind of handed everything off to Bo and the professor, and they just knew that they had to go back a couple more times. That That's there crazy. was really something, you know, historically that could have been done. That's crazy. So, I mean, you've been an agent since you said 93, 95, 93. 93. So, I mean, you're coming up on 30 years. Yeah. Um, how have you seen it change in the last 30 years? It's a different game. I think the biggest change now are the asks. You know, it used to be always about top tier talk shows, and now it's all about how many TikTok posts and Instagram uh, swipe ups and 
everything was always about top tier talk shows and the morning shows to promote a product service a campaign and now it's literally you have your celebrity go on and you know do a certain post or have the social media team do it and that was just something that was not around you know in the 90s when i was growing up in the business yeah it's dude it's crazy because it's so much easier from i'll call myself like a mini celebrity you know i i get these brand deals uh you know and i'm like oh dude somebody's paying me 10 grand for like two seconds of work mm -hmm. like this is pretty cool mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I, I mainly promote my own companies, which make me far more than any brand deal, mm -hmm. but it's just like, it's crazy. Just like literal, literal fingertips, the about the, like the ability to make money with influence. We had a uh, Chevy chase in I think it was North Carolina last November. And, uh, my boy Cam reached out for me and raising Cane's chicken, wanted to do a quickie little one hour vignette type of social swipe up campaign on Instagram, or he was in the drive through and handing people, you know, bags of chicken or whatever. And uh, Chevy actively just got involved in social. My boy Patrick Canino has done a tremendous job building his. And uh, literally that one little spot that ran for a couple of days, he now has a uh, national commercial campaign starting in a couple of weeks with Raising Cane's Chicken because they just <laughs> loved him so much. That's funny. I love it. So I'm curious just from like the business perspective, like with all the clients and deals and everything else for those who don't know like how does it work as an agent like what do you guys make for negotiating deals like what's the revenues and all that stuff but that's like really just depends on any given month you know and also obviously the celebrity everybody has different market value i'd say top top tier are always guys like magic and hulk um you know chevy is right up there too um, your commission you know, would be less for those guys yeah it, but still substantial money yeah they're you getting know, huge paychecks names, you know it's you know, you know, some you, you could be talking multi millions on an endorsement deal versus somebody that's still on the cusp of an A list, B plus list that you're still talking a half a million bucks, you know, a million bucks for something really solid for them to get behind. So they're all, you know, up there. And right. um, it just also depends on structure. There's a lot of opportunities. I'm uh, talking right now, uh, Dominique Wilkins and I had an amazing call a couple of days ago about a historic restaurant franchise where he's given equity ownership locations. Um, a lot of guys understand the big picture. The big play is obviously the equity yeah. rather than taking all the money up front. There's a balance sometimes of both, but it really just depends on that tailored opportunity, how we'll look and how we'll break it down. But when they really see something that has the ability to build, scale, grow, and sell, they're smart enough to understand, let me get my equity out of this too. Right, right. So I guess on your side, what would be a typical commission you make on a deal? I mean, I know it varies, but like, what's the range look like? It varies. It could be uh, on larger deals, you know, it's typically like 10 to 15%. And then other mid-level deals could be 15 to 20%. Okay. Um, I, again, it also depends on the structure of the deal and, you know, how significant it is. Obviously, as agents, when you're working for some of the not just most well-known iconic celebrities of all time, but some of the wealthiest sometimes you you're you're okay obviously getting the deal done taking less yeah cuz the long run to 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 most of them at this stage in their life they love making money they don't need to a lot of it is about staying relevant uh the right partnerships in their um you know for their brand um the money's not going to change their lives but for us there it's twofold because not only we want to keep producing for the celebrities we want to build the relationship with that corporation. Yeah, because they're going to so you can pitch other celebrities. Sideways, yeah. It's also about that repeat business because if we can get one or two celebrities booked, um, you know, to 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 back a product or a new initiative, and we know that they're you know top tier people that are going to really produce. Guess what? That corporation now comes back to us and say, "Who do you have in six months? We want to hire another three, four different celebrities." Yeah, I noticed that with my own like there's all these like social media influencer you know companies that they don't work for me but they work for the brands and then they know like okay ryan would be great for this and then they go and make their cut hiring me and yep. you know all that stuff so totally I i've seen that like they're like oh ryan's easy to work with well mm -hmm. we know he's perfect for this right so, exactly that's cool um i mean at this point in your career with you know, having these legacy clients and these guys who are just such big A-list people. Um, I mean, how many millions are you guys transacting a year in like these deals for them? 
I mean, we're, we do over eight figures a year in yeah. business, you know, f from an array, like I said, of everything from endorsements, keynote speeches, um, regular appearances, intellectual property, uh, regional and national commercial campaigns. So it, it adds up pretty quickly. We're very fortunate that we have who we have and they all, you know, stayed, uh, you know, incredibly, uh, you know, relevant. You know, Ric Flair's another one. I mean, he's crushing it we have a deal right <laughs> how now. many woo uh, yeah. commercials does he have I, yeah i mean he's just he's got the best gimmick going and yeah. um we did uh an endorsement deal with kevin harrington who's a business partner uh the the original shark tank judge for this company called new image and it's called mount everest and it's a male enhancement type of product <laughs> and they loved him so much they wanted a female so carmen Electra is now um involved in new image and she has a hair care supplement and also something called screamer gel right which is almost like a female viagra so again that's how it works it's always about leveraging and putting the right celebrity partner in so right. then that brand can come back to us and say who else can you bring that, that that's gonna you know really move the needle that makes sense what would you say for the people that are like these new celebrities i would call them the social media influencers right like because it used to be the only way to become known was be an actor be an athlete you know like there, there wasn't many ways to become known now it's like these tiktok stars these youtubers are more famous than ever like because they're getting all the views they're yep. literally getting hundreds of millions and billions of views like yep. how are you assessing their value compared to i guess the the legacy clients values who were, were the traditional like a-list celebrities i think it's different you know i think uh you've heard the term insta famous and yeah not not that they haven't built unbelievable brands but you know where's the legacy at a certain point hopefully it's you know you know growing this behemoth brand and they all continue to do so and they're smart enough to surround themselves with the the right people but when you're let's face it when you're an iconic athlete with the hall of fame career it, as they say forever. legends never die it's next level you yeah. know um you, you know what what they've you know, accomplished, uh, that never goes away. Um, so I think, uh, I just think, like I said, you know, it's a very different time, man, because so different. it is incredible what's happening with some of these influencers and like, you see guys like Jake and Logan Paul. I mean, I was about to bring God, them up. God, God bless them because you know, it's a beautiful thing. I remember a couple of years ago, my boy bear had me on the phone with them. They wanted to do like some crazy, like, fun promos with like Hulk Hogan and some collaborations. And I think it was Logan that wanted to like try to out rebound Dennis Rodman. <laughs> and, you know, so I love that because here's like the young stars of today that also look up to the people that, you know, I've uh, been able to more importantly that then the business built such a personal bond with, uh, you know, my celebrity clients. It's more at this stage of my life. It's more just a family, Bob. I mean, 90% of my conversations are about life. They yeah, really not truly even about aren't deals. about business anymore. Magic and I spoke for a half hour a couple Thursdays ago in the morning, and I'm not even kidding, probably 25 minutes was about life and talking about, you know, some memories that we've had together and how good life is and my personal mission in life being that it's about recovery and helping people. And, uh, you know, Hulk, it's same thing. You know, Rick, you know, Charlie, Chevy, Carmen. Um, I love that because we kind of came together on business, but then we built this beautiful, trusting, loving family type of relationship. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the Paul brothers because, um, you know, they're taking the opposite approach. They're, they become viral YouTube stars yep. and then they go into sports, you know, yep. they start yep. boxing and, you know, uh, they're making a lot of money doing it. They're like Logan's fighting Floyd Mayweather. It's yep. just a crazy world, man. Yep. Like uh. how do guys with no boxing experience or expertise become the biggest, you know, boxers as far as box office draws, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's incredible. I mean, but, but look, they put the work in too. Yeah. It's not a gimmick. They, they both can fight. They both train. I mean, I think everything that has been structured in their social media brand and everything else they've done on YouTube, they put that same type of energy and drive into now becoming real boxers and, and athletes and said, you can't hate on that. I mean, God no. bless them. That's, you know, to, to, to me and the younger generation, I mean, that's inspiring. That's motivating. Yeah. No, I love it. It, it, it actually, the, the more I see guys like that and then guys like Mr. Beast just oh, incredible. St start all <laughs> these businesses with his influence. And I mean, the kid, is going to be a billionaire before he's 30 with yep. all the things he's doing. Yeah. And it just made me realize like, 
man, I grew up where, yeah, the path to fame and riches was playing sports. And so that's yeah. what I pursued. I I did that and I was not successful. Well, I mean, I was successful to a degree. I became a pro, but I never got the big contract, right? right? And now I look at my life and I'm like, dude, you know, I get a million views a day on social media. I, you know, got these brands wanting to do stuff. We got fans and all these things. And I'm like, this is freaking crazy. And I'm just kind of thinking going forward, like, man, okay, where does this even go? You know, you talk about a guy like David Goggins, who, you know, is a social media guy and, you know, he writes a best selling book and now he's going on stage and, you know, he's getting six figures plus to go on stage. And, I'm just like, man, where should like where do I take my own career? Mm-hmm. You know, what what would it be smart for me to hire an agent or anything like that for the future? What do you think? I think you could. I mean, for sure. I mean, you're young enough to do it. And I, I think I think there's also a niche market for you. I mean, these athletes that really, as we were talking about earlier, that might have a short lived career that don't know what to do. Um, realizing that, oh wow, this is kind of scary. I had a five year career and I this money that I've made probably has to last me the next 20, 30 years. What do I do so I don't make mistakes? It's not about taking big risks to get big gains. It's about what you do to preserve it and involve yourself with the right circle around you of people, which obviously you have too, right? Um, to, 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 to be successful. Because I think, I think it's seven out of 10 athletes within like four or five years after the career is over, they're done. You know, they're broke. Like it's they crazy. don't know. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's crazy. So today's podcast is brought to you by Future Flipper. So Future Flipper is a real estate education company that I founded back in 2018. And since then, we have helped thousands of students all across the country learn how to invest in real estate. And it doesn't matter whether you're trying to learn how to flip houses, whether you're looking to wholesale or build your rental portfolio, we've helped everyone in all the different circumstances. This even includes people who have never done a real estate deal. We've helped beginners get their very first deal. We helped other people who have already done some deals scale to doing multiple deals a month. And we've even helped people get to my level, people to scale their business to doing over 100 deals a year learning to become an owner of the company and not be involved in the day-to-day and learn how to delegate and hire employees at the highest level. So regardless of what boat you are in, we can help you out at Future Flipper. We've got amazing events. We've got amazing coaches. I coach directly in Future Flipper, and I would love to help you get to the next level. So all that being said, if you are interested in getting a free consultation call, a free strategy call to see what it's going to take to help you get to the next level, go to futureflipper.com and you can book a call with my team. Once again, check out futureflipper.com to book a call. So everyone knows I'm a huge advocate of investing in real estate. And for a lot of people, that means building their own real estate investing company. But there's a certain set of people where that doesn't make sense. If you already have a very successful business, your time is actually better spent building out that current business versus trying to start a real estate business from scratch. And what you should be doing instead is investing your money in a real estate fund like Pineda Capital. It's pretty simple how it works. At Pineda Capital, we find the best deals in commercial real estate all over the country. We use my network, my marketing tactics, and we locate what we think has a great um, opportunity for upside through value add, such as getting them leased up and stabilized, such as, you know, doing a lot of renovations, or we just bought a deal that was severely under market value and we got a great deal. No matter what, though. It's easier for many accredited investors to just invest with us and let them focus on their own business versus having to go fix them up, get it stabilized, and increase the value over time. Um, So if you are in that boat and you're thinking about, hey, you know what? I want to be more passive on my real estate investments. I don't want to be doing all the dirty work and finding deals. I don't even know maybe what a great deal looks like. Well, it's probably better for you to just give your money to the experts and let us do it at Pineda Capital. So if that sounds like you, it's pretty simple. Um, You can go to PinedaCapital.com and apply for a free consultation call for our team. They'll explain to you exactly how it works, how we operate, and how we can get you in on our next deal today. And let me lastly say that even if you're in the real estate space right now and you're an accredited investor, it's still a great opportunity to invest with us because we get access to deals that other people don't. So if you're looking to get into great deals or you actually even want to work with us on a deal and send us one to partner on, still go to PinedaCapital.com as well. Apply for a call with our team and uh, let's go make some money together real estate investing. So tell me about just um, 
your journey? I mean, we're talking about these athletes, these celebrities. Um, I mean, on the road to growing your firm, like what have been the roadblocks? Um, I mean, my personal struggle. I, I think I told you uh, like earlier when uh, I grew up, you would have thought was a perfectly normal life. Great loving mother and father and a sister that I'm close with to this day. Uh, but I was just crippled with anxiety. I, uh, I never felt a part of, I never felt good enough. I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I was put in small classrooms and classified as having a severe learning disability. And I think, uh, I speak all over the world now and I think I'm more passionate when it comes to kids and high school kids and junior high kids, because I, I don't want them to be like me and not have the courage to speak up because I didn't speak up. And I think it did a number on my psyche. And when uh, I was 14, I was in sleepaway camp. I had terrible stomach pains one night and the nurse gave me this green liquid and um, in a clear cough syrup cup. And um, I took it not knowing what it was. And within two, three minutes, that green liquid introduced me to the world. I finally felt whole. I felt good enough. I smelled just as smart, just as popular, just as comfortable with my own skin. Right? And I got back to the bunk and now the funny guys are laughing with me, not at me. I got the courage to go flirt with girls in the bunk next next to me for the first time. And, you know, thinking nothing of it, I, I, I felt like Superman. I felt like that green liquid introduced everybody to Darren Prince. What was it? And uh, it was liquid Demerol. And um, this is 1984. Next night, I remember no stomach pains, but that disease, that brain was just obsessing or whatever that feeling was. And I healed over and I lied to the counselor because I wanted to get more of it. I did this for two, two and a half weeks, three weeks until my mom and dad came up visitation day and found out what I was doing. And um, that was the start of it. I mean, 24 years of chasing that high, 24 years and multiple overdoses, one here in Vegas in 2007. And the whole way eventually, you know, selling one company, starting another, selling that, eventually getting into the agency. I thought that's what gave me my superpowers. When in reality, anyone listening knows that drugs and alcohol and substance abuse, what it, what it gives, it takes away a hundredfold at a certain point. And um, I was highly functioning, you know, rolling with the biggest stars in the world. And, you know, every guy just looked at my dream life, having no idea what I was suffering with in silence until, um, you know, I literally had such a broken soul uh, you know, I didn't want to live the last year and a half, two years. I, I was just so sick and tired of being sick and tired. And what was once, I would say, I kind of put it like this, living to use turned out to using to live. And uh, I had my God moment on July 2nd, 2008. Yeah, what happened? So I was in a apartment in New York City with my then wife. And um, my uncle and his then girlfriend happened to be visiting my, from Miami the day before. And I didn't know this woman, never met her before. And I was teeter-totting with going into rehab or how do I do this? Do I go to a spa and detox? And I didn't want a lot of people knowing, even though Magic and Hulk knew and a couple of clients knew and maybe three, four people in my inner circle knew because I was hiding it from so many. Um, and sh she looked at me and asked if I was okay. And I had these tractor beams. I know sometimes people can understand what that means. Once in a while in life, that happens. And I just told her everything. And she's like, do you realize that you're an addict or life's so manageable? I said, yeah. And she goes, do you realize you're powerless? I said, yeah. And she's like, I'm going to ask you the last thing. Do you realize that the disease of addiction does not discriminate? It doesn't matter if you're from Yale or Jill or Park Avenue or Park Bench because all of this, and she started looking at all the pictures on my walls with all the stars and all the accolades. This doesn't mean anything because you don't mean anything. Mm. and that broke my soul, you know, and I started to cry, and she's like, "This, it, it, it's okay, or you want to do anything it takes, I could help you. I just celebrated five years sober. I'm very involved in the world of recovery, and I was like, I'll do anything, and so she put me on a detox plan that uh, 36 hours later was Sunday night, July 2nd, 2000. I came back from the gym. I'm, the detox pains are horrific. I'm you know, crawling out of my skin. I called them up. I said, I can't do it. I'm going to call the doctor and get what I really need to get. And I'm, as I'm screaming on the phone and my uncle said, it's time to kick the crap out of this disease. It's time to own up to it. Put your freaking ego aside, find yourself a 12 step meeting and 
you're in New York City, there's a million of them. Go online and tell these people you're sick and suffering. And, you know, my ego was too big. I said, there's no way. I hung up the phone, ran into the bathroom, going through all the medicine cabinets, trying to find some non-narcotic anxiety pills. And out came two Vicodins, which was one of the three opiates I was addicted to. It was Oxys, Vicodins, and Percocets. And my ex and I thought that we cleaned out all the medicine cabinets. So it was bizarre that why did these two pop out? And in that split second, it actually seemed like a gift from God. It seemed like exactly what I needed. But then I, you know, that miracle happened and I wanted to live more than I wanted to die. And I felt on my knees shaking and calling out to God like I never did before in my life. I said, take the money, take the business, take the notoriety. I need a single day of freedom. If you take me out of hell, I will spend one day at a time taking others out with me. And it was truly um a white light moment my, my right shoulder caught fire i heard a voice say i've got you and you're ready i my hand opened up i flushed the pills 10 minutes later i'm in a taxi cab there's no uber back in 2008 <laughs> on this beautiful summer night of july 2nd and i'm looking up at the sky and i said oh my god for the first time in my life i wanted to stay soap more than i wanted to get high i walked into this church basement 150 to 200 addicts and alcoholics who were once in a hopeless state of mind. I heard the leader say, is there anybody new or struggling? I believe it was the hand of God that lifted it because this so-called big time super agent was full of shit. He was a freaking fraud. I couldn't stay sober more than an hour at a time. And this hand went up. I said, I'm sick, I'm suffering, and I need help. Mm. And I believe that's when I surrendered. And uh, I embraced the five A's, which I think everybody can understand in life. If you implement this with any challenges or hurdles, it's attitude adjustment, acceptance, action, and accountability. And I put them into my heart and my soul and about a dozen spiritual brothers and sisters who didn't know me. When I put my hand up, I said, I'm sick, I'm suffering, I'm suicidal. They told me that, you know, stick with the winners. If I want what they have, then do what they do. And they told me something I'll never forget, that they're going to love me before I ever love them learn to love myself and what i thought was the worst day in my life is now my very best mm. that's amazing dude i'm i was getting goosebumps listening to that story and you know it resonates with me because um my cousin growing up he's a year older than me his name was jeff um he died from an overdose of opioids i lost somebody a few days ago yeah it's it's crazy it's a crazy um epidemic and it's so freely available for just those who want it. And, um, you know, very few have that come to God moment. You know, um, I know many alcoholics, many drug addicts that, you know, trying to do it on your own power is just so yeah. impossible. Impossible. And um, a few weeks ago, it's ironic, this, you know, came up uh, about the overdose. You know, Suboxone was something that I got addicted to, the intermediate drug. And Dr. Drew, is a dear friend, was the one that kind of raised to my attention that it was something I had to get off. I struggled with that. And I was contacted by this group, Bridge Therapeutics. And I'm so excited because this is something I wish I had. It was a reason why I teeter-totter so long. Do I go to rehab? Do I not go to rehab? Am I too important to go to rehab? Do I have too much, you know, to lose business-wise? And, you know, when I took something, and I can guarantee you got a lot of people listening and know exactly what Suboxone is. You get just as addicted to it. And, um, you know, it was something that took 10 to 15 minutes to hit the system. Brutal. The last year and a half of my life. Brutal. I couldn't even get out of bed. Didn't matter what was going on with business. I my brain didn't even start functioning. So this group Bridge Therapeutics, um, I'm now on the part of the commercial advisory board to just get this out there because I know it's gonna change and save lives. It takes seconds to hit the system. And I know there's people just like Darren Prince, like, oh, I can't go to rehab. I can't let people know. I um, yeah, you know, I'm too important of a figure. And that's why so many, especially opiate addicts, are not making it because the pain of making that change is next to impossible versus the comfortability of staying the same. Right. We we're gonna lose during this interview probably ten to twelve people in America. We lose about 185 people a day mm. during um this whole opiate epidemic. And it's getting freaking worse. Yeah. So do you think um you know, for all these people who are, I guess, addicted, it just comes down to surrender. How do you think that they can take action if they're listening? Accountability and action. Yeah. 
because guess what? If anybody listening, you don't want it, you ain't gonna get it. If 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 you're the one that's trying to get the addict or the alcoholic or the substance abuse abuser sober, ain't gonna happen. You gotta want this more than anything you want in your life. There's nothing that comes before my recovery. I'll I'll close down Prince Marketing Group tomorrow. I'll lose all the money tomorrow because you know what? I found me. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in the studio and a lot of very well accomplished, successful entrepreneurs that you're going to have sit in this chair that are worth a fortune of money yeah. that still don't know what that means, that are still riddled with character defects. I found self-love on this journey for the first time in my life. And I built self-esteem, not for Magic Johnson or Muhammad Ali or Joe Frazier or Hulk Hogan. I've done that by doing esteemable acts and being of service to other people. Mm. And when you find yourself deep in your soul and, and understand what it's like to look in the mirror and be proud of that person, they become understanding, I'm still not perfect, I still make mistakes, but I make such better quality of mistakes now. And I watch my spiritual vibe is everything in my life. I, I try to say what I mean now, mean what I say and not say it mean. Right. The next time you're about to engage with somebody, remember I told you this, don't engage. Don't engage, because your energy will be manifested to be complete crap that day. And in 10 minutes, if you shut your mouth, you don't send that text, and anybody listening, guess what's gonna happen? You're not gonna remember in 10 minutes what was about to piss you off, but you engage, oh yeah, trust me, and especially for somebody in recovery, I don't have the luxury of picking up a drink or a pill or a substance or a joint. So I have to always remind myself of that. I'd rather understand people instead of me being understood. Mm. And all these little things that I've learned along the spiritual journey, is the gift that I've been given to now get it out into the universe when I speak, when I do great podcasts to meet tremendous people like you. Because it's not just about, you know, putting the plug in the jug and throwing out the drugs when you're abusing substances or any sort of trauma or healing you're trying to get to. It's people, places, and things. And you've heard this before. And all arise of life. And you want to get to a place of healing, whether it's that trauma that you've dealt with. And let's face it, everybody has different levels of it. Some could obviously be way worse than others. But it's who you surround yourself with. It's taking that action to make that change is everything. And most importantly, owning up to it. Yep. I'm not going to point the fingers at the nurse or the dentist or my mother because she had pills in the house at certain times. It's me. Yeah, I had an issue with me that I had to dig deep down into and say, why did this happen? Why did Darren never feel worthy, even at the top of an industry? What was it with him? And I was able to slowly work on that during the past 14 plus years. And, you know, like I said, I'm mostly at that point where I, I, I truly have that self-love for the first time in my life. Not perfect. Yeah. None of us are. No. But I'm quick to take that action to correct that behavior when it happens. And that's a great thing. Yeah, it, it just sounds like so much of two things. One, like you said, accountability, you know, you're taking accountability for your decisions in your life. It's not anyone else's fault. It's not the counselor who gave you that first hit, you know, mm. it's you. Mm. And, you know, the second thing is just, you know, constantly being self-aware yep. of the things that tempt you, the things that can derail you, the things that, you know, you know, you shouldn't be doing. And like knowing that, Hey, when I get off track a little bit, yep. I know I'm not going to, completely go off the rails i'm gonna oh. get back on <clears throat> get back on the track I, I, and look i'm human i understand that happens i mean it could be i'm, I'm in the gym five days a week, but it still could be a bad cheat days because sugar could be yeah you know my weakness but you know getting back to your business and your audience especially too all of this is parallel to the world of entrepreneurship and business and real estate and everything else because it's about accountability it's about taking an action it's about your surroundings of the right people. It's yeah. a lot about mindset. It's about the proper rest, taking care of yourself. Um, I've always believed in mentors or at least people that are where you're trying to get to, right. not listening to friends and people that aren't there, but listening to the ones that have gotten there because you save a fortune of money and a ton of time relying on their expertise and what they've been through. Right. Well, even, you know, to, to kind of even think about your clients, right? You mentioned Charlie Sheen as a client and as somebody who's had a very public bout with mm. the same things you're talking about, uh, how's he doing now? How have you guys connected over this? He's amazing. We bond, we laugh our ass off. You know, we, uh, you know, he's, I think he's got probably five, six years sober now. He's a great dad. And, um, you know, he's been thrown up. They all have. What yeah. celebrity is it? Well, what, what celebrity isn't human and hasn't had something that uh, 
you know, hasn't derailed them or challenged them. And, you know, I, I told you before this all started, I see what happens. You know, I, I was with Mike Tyson one time telling me about, you know, who gave him a handbook on life to deal with 200 million at 19 years <laughs> old. And, you know, so it's easier for people to judge from afar, but you're not given a handbook on any of this. You know, and, and the truth is when you make it at such a young age as an athlete, an entertainer, an influencer, a celebrity, a musician, where are those coping mechanisms to deal with the fortune of money and all the temptations on life? You're still in those developmental years yourself to understand who you really are. Yeah. And so it's a blessing and a curse. So very few actually don't make those mistakes very few are grounded enough to really at a young age surround themselves with the right group of people it's just human nature yeah it's funny because i mean i grew up in sports and i know the behind the scenes of a lot of athletes and famous people and like you said man they're all struggling with drugs alcohol depression womanizing whatever their their vice is yeah. right they're struggling i was actually reading a article the other day with um let's talk about john wall for those who don't know john wall uh, i think he's with the rockets right now yep. and i mean the dude number one overall pick been mm -hmm. in all stars made hundreds of millions of dollars in his career i think last year he made like 40 million dollars right mm -hmm. but the last few years for him have been pretty rough he's tore his achilles you know he keeps getting traded these teams don't necessarily really want him because he's got such a, a bloated contract mm -hmm. And um, I, I saw him in the interview talking about something like suicidal thoughts and depression. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people would look at them like, what does this dude got to be depressed about? He's chilling. And it's like, no, no amount of money, success, fame will can fix what's going on inside of you. A hundred percent. We talked about my boy Omar. You know, I was on his podcast and, you know, I said it then and I'll typically say it as often as possible. You know, money doesn't buy happiness. It buys temporary happiness. It kind of like my boy Dave Melcher says, it buys the ability to shop, which can make people happy. It buys the ability to take care of people that you care about and love. And yeah, maybe in a depressive state, it can give you that little quick fix. But at the end of the day, um, it doesn't buy long-term happiness. You still have challenges and obstacles in life um, that... You know, look at some of the celebrities we lose. Happens all the time. Right. You know, enormous wealth, fame, fortune, legacy, the greatest of what they've done. How many of them have overdosed? Look at some of the most iconic figures. Just in the past few years, you got Heath Ledger, Amy Winehouse, you got Prince, you got Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Whitney Houston, Janis Joplin. What's the common theme with every one of them? It's drugs. Drugs. Addiction. Yep. It's crazy. Recently at one of my events, Heather Blankenship, who is a very big real estate investor, came up to me and said, Ryan, this event was absolutely amazing. The community you've built is amazing. But I have one criticism. There's not a lot of women here. And I said, Heather, I wish that there was more women here. I just don't know how to solve the problem. And this is a problem that I've seen across any event I've ever gone to. The majority of them are all very male dominated in real estate, business and entrepreneurship. And she said, I know I struggle with the same problem as a woman who's in real estate. Like I'm always around guys. There's not a lot of women that, um, you know, I can really build relationships with or mastermind with. What can we do? And I said, well, there's not really many solutions out there. We should probably start the solution together if uh, this is something you're passionate about. And obviously she was and um, I am as well. And so this led to us starting a mastermind for women called Wealthy Woman. And at Wealthy Woman, it is for um, women who are in entrepreneurship. It is for spouses of entrepreneurs like my wife, Mindy. And this is a place where they can get together and grow in their relationships, grow in their business, support one another, go on retreats and all the cool things um, that don't currently exist today for women in the space. And so I'm really excited about it. And um, it's growing like absolute wildfire. Heather is an amazing leader and CEO. And um, if you're listening to this as a woman or if you you know, or a man and your wife is looking for some type of fellowship with other women in the space, Wealthy Woman is a great spot for you or for them. So if you want to have a free call with our team and see if it's a good fit, go to wealthywoman.io. We can definitely help you out. We would love to have you in the mastermind. Once again, that's wealthywoman.io.
One of my biggest problems with real estate brokerages is that they don't teach the things that are required for realtors and real estate agents to become truly wealthy. They want to teach people how to just do more transactions because that's what makes the brokerage money. Well, as we know, the real way to gain wealth is by investing in real estate. It's by doing your taxes properly. And even if you want to grow the agent side of your business, you're going to have to do things differently in today's world. You're going to have to be really good at social media. You're going to have to market differently. You're going to have to work on your sales game. A lot of those things are going to factor in whether you become wealthy in the long run. And I just realized that over time, brokerages just are not fully equipped to handle all those different verticals. And so that's why I created Wealthy Agent. Wealthy Agent is a platform to teach real estate agents how to become truly wealthy, how to grow their real estate agent business, how to invest properly, how to do their taxes, how to grow on social media to get more leads for free. And so if you are an agent and you are looking to grow that side of your business, go to wealthyagent.io. We would love to chat with you and see if you're a good fit for the program. We are building a community all across the country that you can tap into. So go to wealthyagent.io to book a call today. So what do you think makes a guy, uh, let's say like Magic Johnson, have such longevity? Because Magic went through his own things too, right? I mean, this guy is, you know, Showtime Lakers, all-star, you know, top guy. Then he's got AIDS. HIV. HIV. Yep. And he goes through all these things and, you know, his career ends and, you know, he's got this stigma against him and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden you've seen the last 30 years, this guy is like the best business person ever. Like what makes him different from these other guys who haven't been able to conquer the demons and and just like this? Well, first off, he's got an incredible relationship with cooking and a support system with his family. And he obviously embraced the HIV. Same way on a much smaller scale that, when I got sober and I started seeing signs, especially after my father, may he rest in peace, passed away, and I knew that my dad's crowning achievement wasn't the agency life. It was getting a sober son back for eight and a half years, and I knew that I had a platform to touch the world and mm-hmm. change and save lives long before me on a scale 10 million times bigger. Right. Magic saw that, and that's what he did. He didn't do that for any other reason but to help people, but he also always had the vision even before playing in the NBA, as he talks about so often during his keynotes, and he does a ton of them, he always wanted to be a businessman. He knew that basketball was only going to be around a certain time period, mm-hmm. and you know you could see documentaries on him, how brilliant he was to get out into the court before any of the other players, not just to warm up and practice, but he wanted access to all the big Hollywood executives <laughs> in the prime of his career to know, let me set up lunch with this one, dinner with that one ah. next week. Let me hook this one up with one of my charity events. So he used that prime of his career to surround himself with some of the most incredible mentors that he knew when the time came, he was already set. He was a good networker. And, yeah, and everything about him is long-term relationships. You know, he there's very few people, if any, I even know on his team since even before I came on board that that are still not there. You know, he's um, you know, he he's a master at what he does. The same way he was a floor general for the Lakers, he's that same way in business. And um, you know, from everything with, you know, Howard Schultz and Starbucks and the movie theaters and, you know, giving back to his community and employing probably upwards of 100,000 people now from, you know, Sodexco and, you know, it, you know, all the other business ventures that he has is it's unbelievable. And, you know, he, he was so important to me when I, I decided to write Amy High, um, my, my memoir, and, you know, I can't thank him enough for writing the forward on it, but, you know, It's always like when you're in that place of service and giving back and you don't do this for it, but God can't help but to reward you in other ways. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it because it feels good. You do it because you're helping other people either get out of a place or give them an opportunity. And just by default, life just gets better when you live in that in that lane. He didn't hide from anything, you know, and um He's literally got a you know billion dollar business brand now, most successful <laughs> you know athlete, entrepreneur, pure entrepreneur that that we've ever seen. Yeah, it's crazy. What are some of the businesses he owns now? I don't even. I know he's super successful. 
Yeah, he's got um well I I know what he has had over the years. One I said Burger King, Fat Burgers, TGI Fridays, movie theaters, the Starbucks. Um now he you know, he's owns the Dodgers and yep. the LA Sparks and um uh it's the LA Galaxy. I think the He's just the, waiting the, the for the bus family team. to yeah, sell them. It's um <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's just unbelievable. My head spins. I, I thank him and we laugh when I talk to him that he still actually is interested in marketing opportunities that we bring him because you don't need he to doesn't have to work again. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, he just loves people. So he loves people. Um, he loves making people smile. He loves motivating and inspiring. And, um, you know, I, I, I just think he, he loves to keep building to his legacy and he loves staying active. And How do you think he, because um, I'm a Lakers fan, so... <laughs> You know, obviously, we we haven't been too hot the last couple of years. No, um, but you know, he was uh, was he the president before? I, I think at one point he might have been. Yeah, um, a few years ago, president. he helped get LeBron over. Yep, and then I was with him that day it happened. Not with LeBron, we had an appearance that day. Yeah, tell me about the day that the Lakers got LeBron. I didn't even know. It was so funny. He was so secretive. He's basically at a, I think we had an autograph appearance with Kareem somewhere. And he's just like, I got to get out at a certain time. Yeah. And it was just hilarious because obviously he couldn't even tell me. And I remember like the next day was all over the news that yeah, he was coming. laying outside LeBron's and walked in at like 6.01 p.m. because it had to be at 6 o'clock. If you went any earlier, I guess you're in Tampering. violations of, yeah. And um, yeah, but I mean, that's, it's magic johnson like there's no he's got that billion dollar smile he just makes everybody feel like the most important person in the room he said they were going to get a championship look i guess it didn't happen the first year but they got it the they second got it. year you know they got it yep. yeah no i just remember you know as a lakers fan uh him and palinka and then yep. you know i know magic i think he resigned yes. at, at some point and then you know everything worked out yeah got the championship and it was great um it's just like interesting to me that, you know, guys like that still continue to stay motivated, right? Like he didn't have to go and work for the Lakers no. again. You know, he doesn't <laughs> no. have to do these brand deals. He doesn't have no. to keep acquiring businesses. No. But, you know, when you're driven and you want to be great and excellent, you just keep doing I it. I think it's it's just the game. It's the legacy. It's, you know, always staying stimulated and excited and finding different opportunities and good partners to be around. And, um, you know. Hulk, you know, Hulk kind of has that in him. He doesn't have the entrepreneurial success that 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 magic does. But certainly, when I look at his brand, Hulk Mania. I mean, we're talking forty plus years. He's one of the most cultural iconic figures in the world still. You know, and, yeah, Hulk um, Hogan, dude. But still likes to look for new and innovative partnerships that kind of make sense for legacy. You know. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Like even with wrestling, man, you see. They're Got superheroes, those guys. I mean, they're very different than a typical athlete. And with all due respect to basketball, football, baseball, and hockey, and even boxing champions, wrestlers are superheroes. They live a persona. Ric Flair lives Ric Flair. I mean, when I'm out with those guys, it is from the biggest <laughs> celebrities in the world to just fans just become little kids. I mean, they just live and breathe. Well, they're a hybrid. The they live and breathe the characters that they are. Yeah, I know? mean, they're both entertainers and athletes. Yeah. They're the best of both worlds. Yep. And I mean, you look at Hulk Hogan, you look at The Rock. Yep. The Rock is the biggest actor in the world. Yep. Yep. You know, you see uh, back to the Paul brothers, Logan Paul's now in WWE doing I stuff. Think too. About it. There you go. You got Logan that's going to WWE, but they realize what a platform wrestling is. You know, it's crazy that wrestling, even though it's fake and everyone like knows well, the outcome as Hulk's always told yeah. me, the outcome is, is, is fake, <laughs> but no one cares. They are physically beating the crap out of each other. You right. know, when Hulk, when Hulk's gotten 19 surgeries in the past 12 years, wow, I could tell you they're kicking the crap out of each other. Right. You know, that's where the athleticism needs to come in because they are really. How old is Hulk now? He's got to be he like just 60. 69 in August. He's almost 70. Yeah. Like, I don't know how he's still getting in the ring and doing things. <laughs> well, he's not. He's not. I know he wants one more match. I hope he doesn't <laughs> go there. Rick had his match about three, four weeks ago in Nashville. He uh -huh. did one more match. Um, I think Rick's 73 or 74. <laughs> but it's in their blood, man. I mean, I get it. Like, I saw Triple H speaking on somebody's podcast last week about how he's trying to get The Rock to WrestleMania this year in L.A. And he's well, The Rock could do it. The Rock is... He does. He's like, there's nothing as a wrestler in the world. There's no movie you will ever write, be a part of, star in, that's going to give you that pop of when you're in the ring 
with a hundred thousand people around it. I get it. I mean, it's I, I hear the way Rick and Hulk talk about it and how Hulk was in WrestleMania in Toronto wrestling the rock and what it was like against Andre and Savage and Ultimate Warrior. And I hear about Flair's matches and I hear the stories from and it's literally a state of euphoria for them. Like they just how do you you know, they talk about athletes dying twice. Once you knew where to retire, and then once when you really pass. Right. Those guys, like, I mean, they're at a different level of stardom. And, like, you know, they're literally walking through airports and at restaurants living who this alias alter ego is on top of it. So I can't imagine, you know, what that must be like for them at times. And, you know, Rick and Hulk, they still walk around, and every time me and my, my, my team is around them, you would think they're still the champions of the world. <laughs> How do you not miss that, though? You know, putting those type of smile on people's faces and knowing how you've impacted culture and legacy for yeah. decades and decades, you know? And there's, I, I remember watching a, a Rams game a couple of years ago. Was it Jared Goff, I think, was the quarterback back then yep. before uh, Stafford? And it was a Monday night game, and his snap count was Ric Flair, Ric Flair. And <laughs> I, mean, I call up, I call him Nature, and I called them up, but I go, Nature, are you watching? And he goes, Yeah, a bunch of people just called me. He's like, Pretty cool. Like, they they just don't, you know, they don't make them like that anymore. So no. It's just like a whole next level of like, wow. Yeah, I wonder how wrestling will be going forward. Cause I mean, obviously, all these guys are big stars. Um, and I know like John Cena has transitioned well. But I like I haven't kept up to date. Like I don't know who's like the big wrestler these days. I'm not into it like at all. Yeah, I went to WrestleMania three four years ago. I think in San Francisco with my boy. Yeah, Nikki C and Bo and Hulk's attorneys. But but, but I did see. You. I, I just Seth. I think Seth Rollins was. I like I don't know. It just doesn't. Just as it doesn't do it for me. Like when, when I was growing up, I think my generation was the best ever because you know we had Hulk, we had Piper, we had Andre. Uh, you know we had uh macho man and ultimate warrior well but, but now you got ufc which is taking mm -hmm. a lot of their stuff yep so people wanting to watch other fights so who was your favorite wrestler growing up the rock it was the rock. hands okay. down i i loved wrestling i would practice my rock bottoms and the yeah. people's elbow <laughs> and you know when hulk mania or hulk was nwo I yep. was like, dude, this is tight. Yeah. I would tune in every Thursday to SmackDown. The month the Monday Night Wars and all that. Like, yeah, yeah. Th SmackDown versus Raw. It was great. Eric Bischoff is a dear friend of Hulk's who ran Turner and WCW. And I hear all the stories. And my boy Bo, who actually is the one that took Rob into all the North Korea trips, he told me what it was like in whatever that was, 97, 98. And I, I was just out of it by then. And he's like, bro, you have no idea what it was like <laughs> Tuesday morning walking into high school, the Monday night word for two years this was going on. I'm like, I, I just, you know, it was past my time at that point. Yeah, you no, know, it was tight. When Hulk turned heel and went NWO and yep. walked away from the yellow and red. And all of a sudden he comes out with the gimmick of uh, being a bad guy yep. that it just shook up the world of sports and entertainment like nothing it, did beforehand. You know? Oh, it was it was sick because Hulk was and Hall and Nash. I, I know uh, Hall just passed away, but like, my God, what they meant to culture is incredible. Yeah. No, wrestling is definitely a unique sport in that that regard. And it set the stage for all these other guys like Conor McGregor and you know, even Jake Paul and these guys like, Hey, this is what you got to do yep. to, to get hyped and get people, yep. you know, and this, it's not about your skill. You got to be an entertainer too. Exactly. Exactly. But I mean, that that's where the world is. And yep. you know, this is an agent, like you said, they're, they're not judging actors and actresses based necessarily on their skill level as an actor and act. They're like looking at, Hey, how many followers this person have? Yep. How much promo can they do to get this movie seen? Exactly. Yep. Can they, res you know, do they resonate with this particular audience? You know, their demos, their analytics, everything else that comes across, you know, as a powerful, you know, marketing tool. Yeah. What do you think? This is a random question I was just thinking about because I've seen the debate, but, you know, you own a marketing company, right? And you always hear this debate in business of sales versus marketing. What's more important? Um, well, we, we here's the funny thing. I called the Prince Marketing Group. I was talking to a, a firm um, yesterday, and we're really not a marketing firm when you think about it, you know, because the clients have already marketed themselves. A lot of what we do is more just networking, reach out. I haven't spent a dime on advertising in 25 years. Uh, there's just, you know, 
really no reason to um, because we already have the talent. So all we have to do is just go after certain, you know, uh, markets that we feel would be beneficial for, for different brands. Um, sales, obviously, is where it comes in that we now have to sell what we have, which typically isn't difficult, but you're also still dealing with certain budgets. Yep. And that's where it becomes a little problematic where they might be like, oh, we want Larry Bird or how much would, you know, uh, Joe Montana, you know, some of the other people that we work with uh, cost. And it's like, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're taken back when, when it comes to that. Or look, there's other times where if they're not in, um, you know, startup mode and they, they understand the power of, of celebrity that you see a celebrity one time affiliated with a product service a campaign, the average person remembers it after once. You run a commercial, a typical commercial, it's got to run 25 to 30 times for the average person to run it one time with a celebrity. Mm. You know what's funny is, so I hold events. I've got one coming up in two weeks. It's at the Mandalay Bay. It's mm -hmm. going to be like 600 people. We've pretty much sold it all organically from my following. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got guest speakers in the real estate space and, you know, it's, it's going to be a great event. Um, one thing I've never done is you know, go out and get the celebrity speakers, um, like many other events do. And I was talking to a friend of mine and he was just telling me, yeah, I got a rod at my last event. He cost whatever he cost. You know, I, he, he, another buddy of mine, he's like, I got Emmett Smith. Yeah. I got this guy. And for me, when I hear the numbers, I'm like, man, to spend six figures to yeah. get that guy for an hour, yeah. man, is the return really there? The ROI. Yeah. It depends. I mean, if you're looking to bring on sponsorship, if you're looking to do some sort of intimate meet and greet experience beforehand, um, and there's added value to upsell to your sponsor, um, obviously a 600 person event, you're limited on how much you could, you know, be outlaying in money. But um, we book these guys all the freaking time for a reason. Um, you know, Fleischman, you know, Dan's a, a dear friend of mine, and uh, Roland Frazier, uh, you know, he's got his event in San Diego. We booked talent for, I just had, like I said, Goggins uh, for Marcus, and uh, he had Magic here in May. I think when you have thousands in the audience, it makes sense. Right. You know, um, and I think if you were able to call me one day and said, hey, I got a sponsor that's got 100K, but they want something a little bit extra cool to incentivize their sales team a month before my event. Then you take the top 20 sales reps and say, yeah, you're going to come to your event and you guys are all going to get a 30 minute meet and greet before Magic comes out on stage and talks about his entrepreneurship yeah. uh, story. That's yeah. Then you have an ROI because now that company can invest in bringing in the celebrity because you have 10 people that are hustling like crazy to help the bottom line of that company prior to the event and win the opportunity to be there. Yeah, no, a thousand percent. Yeah. I um, It's funny because I've seen Gary V speak a few times mm -hmm. and I know people who have hired him. Yeah. You know, Gary at this point is like, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand yeah, dollars. He's a good guy. He's a good friend. I was at his office with Hulk. Yeah. A few years ago. It's incredible what he's doing. Yeah. And yeah. I remember my buddy booked him for his event and Gary had already spoke at two other events <laughs> that day in Las Vegas. Yeah. He, he did three events in a day and I'm over there thinking, all right, you know, I'm doing this event for free for my buddy and that's cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, whatever. And then I'm thinking, dude, Gary just made over half a million dollars yep. in the last like four hours, just, just yep. talking on stage saying that, and you know, Gary didn't even prep. He yep. just, no. he wings everything. Yep. And I'm just like, wow, that's yep. crazy. Yep, it is. <laughs> it is. No, there, 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 there's days I've had it with Magic. We're hoping in two or three different states, you know, in the same day. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, I've got uh, somebody in the water recovery, my boy, Chris Heron, who I think is like the, 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 the greatest to do it. Uh, we both got sober in 2008, he used to be the ex Boston Celtic and ESPN's done some incredible documentaries on him. He literally told me he'll be in four or five cities on the same day speaking. Uh, I, That's I, just, crazy. I can't do it. I can't do it. At, at a certain point I got to, you know, uh, I know Goggins always talks about not having balance. Balance is good for a lot of people. I need the balance. Yeah. Because for me, it's life and death. And I have to always make sure emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually, I get that me time, whether it's with my yeah, dog, my girlfriend, people that are important to me to, to pull myself away. Yeah. Goggins and uh, Tim Grover, they're yep. about like the darkness. Exactly. They're like, yep. channel it. And I'm like, I don't think you have to do that, but exactly. teach their own. <laughs> yep. And we have Grover booked with Goggins next June at an event in Florida. Yeah. Yep. They're 
they're just at that level that most people don't understand, but it's incredible what they've both accomplished. Incredible. Yeah. Super crazy. I love it, man. Well, dude, I know you got to get back to Cali. Yeah. You, you've got a flight um, coming up here I soon. I got to come and... back when I have more time, grab lunch or something. Yeah, no, I'd love that. I bet we can find some synergy with each other, with the worlds that we're both involved in. Bro, if you can get me, you know, <laughs> six figures of speaking gig like Gary and, and Magic and these guys, we're going to be really good friends. <laughs> yeah. I'll fly to like four cities a day, whatever you need. I'll That'll pay for the private jet. It'll be good. Perfect. I love it. Cool, love man. It. Well, I appreciate you uh, being vulnerable and sharing your story and just all the insights, man. It's been great. Uh, we'll have to link to your book down below so people can check it out, man. Awesome. Appreciate you Thanks coming on. Thanks for having me, my brother. All right, guys, make sure you're subscribed and we'll see you on the next one. Peace. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wealthy Way podcast. If you got value, there are two things I want you to do. The first is go to wealthyway.com and get access to all of our free stuff. You can download our courses for free. You can use the Wealthy Way Planner for free. You can subscribe to our newsletter. All of it's free. It is such amazing value. I want you to go take advantage of that. The second thing is if you could go to Apple and leave a five-star review, or if you're watching this on YouTube and subscribe, that would be amazing. It would mean a lot to me. In fact, if you leave a review, I might just shout you out on the next episode because we are reading those. So definitely check it out. And thanks for watching.